So today we're going to take a look at this concept of impact-based forecasting and think a little bit about what that means for our work as forecasters and in particular for how we train our forecasters and meteorologists for this new paradigm, if you like, of how we approach weather. So impact-based forecasting does represent a fundamental change in focus in the way a forecaster does their work. And the focus really is from what the weather will be, which, if you like, is the atmospheric change bit, which we all study and, and uh, which we're all hopefully partly of with still, uh, to what the weather will do. In other words, the impact of that weather on society, on users, on the great variety of users from a uh, person going about their normal day-to-day -day business who might have very little exposure to the weather if they're using public transport or sitting in their car and so on, or somebody like a farmer or a, a fisherman or a pilot or somebody who has a very significant exposure to the weather by the nature of the activity which they're engaged in. So the change is really about moving beyond just looking at atmospheric science and moving on to what the atmospherics, if you like, will do when they impact on the work of society. Oh, why do we do this? Well, it arises fairly naturally from a focus on the needs of users. And indeed, this is always been part of, of our work as uh, med services and as forecasters uh, from the very start, from the time of sailing ships, and in particular then through the development of aviation. We've always tried to tailor our forecasts to help the person who needs to make a decision, be it a, a sailing captain or, or an aircraft pilot or whatever. But weather information is normally just one input into the decision making of users. Users have other constraints about their decision making. A pilot may have a perfect weather forecast, but they may not have a slot to get away from an airport to take an, an obvious example. Impact-based forecasting tries to understand something of those other constraints and understand, if you like, the decision-making space that the user is in and present the information in a way which increases the relevance of that information to the process, the decision-making process, which the user must go through. And we should be maybe a little bit humble here and realize that weather forecasts and weather warnings have absolutely zero value to society, or indeed economically, if people don't use them to make decisions. If they're just purely the output of a scientific process and nobody takes any notice of them, then clearly they have no value whatsoever. So to have value to society, we need to better focus our weather forecasts and warnings so that they can be used to the optimum. And that does mean increasing the awareness of forecasters and others within meteorology, researchers also, on the needs and concerns of users. So issues to address, well, forecasting impact is more important than pure meteorological forecasts for this reason that uh, it's really about getting people to make decisions and impact-based forecasts should be more easily understood by those who are at risk be it somebody who's in a, a difficult situation with severe weather coming who needs very clear and concise information to make a quick decision and maybe not a very rational decision people often don't make rational decisions in those situations so they, they need the information very clearly and those responsible for mitigating risks, which would be typically emergency management people or first responders uh, who need to make decisions as to what the actions they should take to help mitigate the risks to those they're, uh, they're responsible for. It's a difficult area for meteorologists who are often a little bit reluctant to forecast impact because we need to know more than meteorology. We need to know something about vulnerability and something about exposure. And these two concepts are central to impact-based forecasting. They build on the meteorology. Uh, vulnerability and exposure, are, they sound a little bit the same, but in fact they're slightly differently focused, but together to give a full picture, if you like, of what the person, the user, um, what position they're in with regard to, particularly with regard to severe weather. So if we look at this uh, diagram here, on the top left in the green areas, uh, we have weather and climate extremes and geophysical hazards, of which weather is obviously a major subset. So these are the, the science bits that we, we are well understood and that we've been studying for, for decades and so on, and where we've developed our models and we have a good forecasting capability. Down in the red area, quantifying and reducing impact is where we want to get to. We want to try and quantify the potential impact of geophysical events uh, on society or on specific groups of users and to try and reduce that impact so that people are either kept safe or 
capable of uh, mitigating losses or indeed making better profits if you're a farmer and, and can make a better uh, harvest or something like that. And then we have these concepts in the middle of exposure and vulnerability. And we have some understanding of these, but in fact, probably there are still limiting factors for many of us in how we put together our science and deliver a service which properly identifies uh, or properly addresses, I should say, the needs of the users. And over on the right, we have this social and economic impact, which is, I suppose, the, uh, the ultimate benefit to society for our work. It's, it's in there somewhere. So the top left is the bit that we traditionally work in. Um, these are solid lines here, and they're all about really the sort of understanding which we typically derive from doing research. So we've been very good at doing research in physical sciences and on developing models. We've not been so good at engaging the social sciences and trying to understand human behavior and how people take our information and translate that into their decision-making uh, paradigms, if you like. And that's where these, uh, these solid lines are, are supposed to represent. They're trying to represent the social science type understanding and research which needs to be done if we are to put together the weather information with the exposure and vulnerability to get to the social and economic impact. But more often than not, we, we kind of short circuit that by this dotted line which goes directly from weather to the impacts. Because as meteorologists and as forecasters, we know a lot of our users and we know well enough that if there's fog in the airport, that that's going to affect the aircraft uh, taking off and landing and so on. We know that if there's a storm at sea, that's going to affect shipping. We know from communication with our users, from talking to them, from listening to them, something of the impact in an informal way. So it's not the, the if you like, the formal research-based uh, approach, which uh, academia would prefer, but there is certainly knowledge about social and economic impact within the NMHS systems, and it's come really from this informal contact which we frequently have, usually have, with users. So we're not starting from, from ground zero here. We do have some knowledge of the relationship between the atmospheric phenomena and their impacts on society, but often it's an informal knowledge, but for all that, it's, it's pretty useful. One thing about uh, impact-based forecasting is it's not something we're going to be able to do by ourselves, because we do need to know something of the businesses and the concerns of our users, and indeed, to be able to anticipate the impacts of different weather scenarios on these businesses, and typically that's not something we know a lot about. Now, you could say, why don't users do this for themselves? Why can't they just take the weather information and apply, if you like, the impact uh, thinking themselves? But very often, users don't know what they want. They don't know the range of services that we can provide from MET services for them. They don't, don't know the range to which we can um, offer, we'll say, possible information which might help them towards uh, solutions to the decision making that they've got to do. So we've got to work with users to educate them as well. Users don't know our business any more than we don't know their business. So in terms of training, I think there are potentially additional skills now needed. We say forecasters here, but in fact, uh, we move beyond this now, particularly in talking of climate services and so on. It's not just the traditional weather forecaster, but anybody who interacts with the users or the public uh, in passing on weather information needs to have probably these additional skills. Understanding of probability, that's pretty well uh, important because we need to better exploit all these EPS or ensemble prediction system products, which of which there are so many now and they are so valuable, but understanding them and, and understanding how they apply to decision making is not at all an obvious sort of thing to do. And even for those of us who are trained in science, understanding these probabilistic uh, charts and diagrams can be a challenge for the users, obviously it can be a, a very significant difficulty. Soft skills then, communication, listening, presentation, these are fundamental to the way that we uh, can actually take the information that we have and apply it best to those who want to use it. We need very good communication skills. Again, it's something which has been in meteorology for a while, obviously weather broadcasting and other aspects of forecasting have focused on communication, but it probably hasn't gone right down through our profession. Uh, situational awareness, being aware to some extent of the position that the user is in and uh, allowing that to influence the way in which we present the information. We don't change the information, but we present it to them 
in a way which they can possibly better understand. Now, one of the uh, parallel exercises that has been happening within the World Meteorological Organization is developing competency requirements. Uh, and this has been done for public weather service type forecasting, as we say this to kind of as a, as a broad umbrella, as opposed to aviation forecasters who I know have a competency framework which was developed a, a couple of years ago, and say marine meteorologists or other specializations. But for your general public weather service type weather advisor or forecaster, these are some competency requirements which we developed and which still have to be, uh, I suppose, filled out with guidance from WMO before they can be properly applied within MET services. This particular series were for what we call a DPM weather advisor, DPM being disaster prevention and mitigation. So for uh, somebody who works in that area of forecasting where they interface with emergency management. So fundamental skills, are they able to communicate warning and associate it information to users? And that implies that they must understand something of the user's needs to be able to do this effectively. Develop products and procedures and services to meet those users' needs, again, implies an understanding of those user needs. Develop and manage relationships. Uh, you're into the whole communication and personal understanding of other people and, and their situation there. Promote and implement impact assessments of community outreach. So there's a training and uh, function there, an outreach and function. And also a difficult area of this to try and assess in some sort of formal way the impact or potential impact of, of severe weather events and then about ensuring the quality of information services and procedures. And these ones were done for weather broadcasters who in a sense are a subset of weather forecasters, but the, uh, subset obviously very much focused on communication. So oral, written and graphical communication is important. The use of appropriate tools and systems for the delivery of hydrometeorological information to end users. So is it best to represent something with a graphic, uh, with a chart, orally, through text, you know, different sorts of information will be better communicated in different ways. Uh, user interaction, uh, that's working with the users in a positive way, and team working. Team working becomes very important because very often now, if we're going to take on this paradigm, we'll be working with people from very different backgrounds. Uh, so understanding their training and, and if you like what their focus is and, and working with them in a team working context becomes very, very important. So partnerships are important. Partnerships with uh, government agencies, with stakeholders, uh, transport people, with the public themselves, with the media. Forecasters will need to work effectively in partnership with very many other groups, uh, both in the preparation phase and in the delivery phase of severe weather information in particular. And data sharing, this is more of a technical thing, of course, but sharing data uh, among different agencies will be vital. So that means demographic data. It means data in formats like GIS, which can readily be uh, moved from, from one platform to another because we're very fond of our, our buffer and, and so on within meteorology and grid, but uh, those, those data formats not readily understood outside meteorology. And also bringing in economic and mapping data and matching that to the weather data. These are more technical things, but I think there will be a need to, to train up for those too. And I suppose coming back to a point we, we mentioned, that understanding of the impacts will come partly from experience, and we have a lot of that in med services, but partly also from the more formal pathways of improving the modeling of vulnerabilities and exposure. So the future role of the forecaster, the question must be asked that is this forecaster's work? Uh, and the answer really is if the forecaster doesn't do this work, then somebody else will, and forecasters will find their role uh, quite diminished. So I think it is the forecaster's role. The forecasters are the ones who have access to information about the possible evolutions of the atmosphere over, at the moment, say, the next 10 to 14 days. Of course, that's uh, being pushed out into monthly forecasts and in some parts of the world, even into seasonal forecasts. So the forecasters and the meteorologists are the ones who have access to the basic information and their ability to understand this information and to contextualize it, to put it in the context of the user, that would be a key to success. But users are also going to need training. This is going to be a long-term project, if you like, uh, which will involve both people within MET services and within the user communities, and especially emergency management, because obviously for most MET services, for all MET services, their first and fundamental duty is in the areas of severe weather and protecting, making sure the citizens of their country are protected from the effects of severe weather. 
So how best to arrange this in practice? Uh, that's an open question. Should we have uh, specializations within meteorology which go beyond, if you like, the bench forecasting type paradigm? Or should we actually train up what we now call bench forecasters uh, in, into acquiring these specializations? Uh, different uh, countries, different vet services would probably have different solutions for this particular question. So in summary, the issues for providing information on the impacts of forecasts and, and warnings, they're many and varied, and they're quite complex. And they're going to require planning on different levels and training particularly on many, many levels. The role of the forecaster will develop more towards interpretization, interpretation pardon me, and contextualization. So the weather bit will come from the models, but understanding how that fits into the lives of the people who are going to use it will be more and more, I think, part of the role of the forecaster and then expressing that weather with that knowledge in the back of their mind. So forecasters in some ways will become more like consultants. And due to the complexity of these issues, there's going to be a, a big training requirement on forecasters, but also on partners and especially on emergency response staff. So that's going to be an essential part of all of this. And that training probably will be more in the form of workshops and seminars and joint events rather than traditional academic type training where, if you like, we, we study um, the hard sums and the equations. This will be more about training, joint training in developing common understanding of uh, both the meteorology and the exposure and the vulnerability and indeed the user needs, common understanding across the community of use. So these are some thoughts towards uh, where forecasting is heading with this paradigm of impact-based forecasting and hopefully some thoughts that uh, 